Eduardo Valfierno was born in Buenos Aires, Argentina, in the year 1850. He came from a very wealthy family, being the son of a rich landowner. During his youth, he would spend his father's money on all sorts of things, from expensive clothes, furniture and holidays. He lived as if he had all the money in the world, which gave him a very luxurious lifestyle. After his father's death, he inherited the family fortune, but due to his buying habits, he wasted the fortune and was left with no money. Trying to maintain his lifestyle, he proceeded by selling pieces of art and antiques that had been in the family for generations. But this was not enough to cover his debts, causing him to go bankrupt. Once he had entered the black market of art, he discovered potential clients willing to buy stolen works. Balfierno frequently visited France, mainly due to his personal attachment to the country, but also because it was a great market for him. Being a con artist who specialised in art, France was the ideal place thanks to the abundance of paintings. In France, he posed as a marquis, telling people his name was the Marquis of Valfierno. It's uncertain why he did this. Most likely, it was to do with him wanting recognition for his upper-class upbringing. During his time in France, it's presumed that he met Jeves Chaudron. Although there's no evidence of this, it's presumed that in 1910, they came up with the idea of stealing the most famous portrait of all time, the Mona Lisa. Jeff Chaudron's life is unknown. He's a complete mystery man. It's possible that he didn't even exist. Nevertheless, as the story goes, he was an apparent art forger who was a master at recreating paintings from the Renaissance. Valfierno asked Chaudron to make six exact copies of the painting. It was the first step in his master plan to earn a fortune. Over the next 14 months, Chaudron recreated to the highest quality possible six exact copies of the Mona Lisa using the same wood, styles and procedures that were typical of the 16th century. Valfiorno contacted his six clients which were willing to buy the stolen Mona Lisa and pay once a the theft had occurred. To aid him in his robbery he hired Vincenzo Perugia. Vincenzo Perugia was born in Varese, Italy in 1881. His early life is undocumented, but he presumably came from a humble background. Perugia was an Italian carpenter and had also worked in the Louvre for several years. In need of money and being influenced by Valfierno that the painting would be stolen for the good of Italy so it could return to its homeland, he accepted the job. Being familiar with the layout of the museum as well as the positioning of staff and security he set out to steal the painting. According to Perugia, on Monday the 21st of August, in the early hours of the morning at 7am, he entered the Louvre alongside other workers, wearing similar clothing, making him blend in. However, the police believed a different story. They suspected that on Sunday afternoon, he snuck into the Louvre, knowing the next day it would be closed to the general public for maintenance, and hid there all night. The security at the Louvre was minimum back in 1911. All he did was wait for the room where the Mona Lisa was displayed to be empty, and he simply lifted it off the wall, removed the frame and case, and wrapped his smock around the painting to hide it. Some believe that he put the painting under his smock. However, being only a small man, measuring only 5 foot 3, and the Mona Lisa being 21 by 30 inches, it was too big to fit underneath his smock. After having the painting covered up, he simply walked out of the museum from the same place that he had entered. He took the painting back to his apartment in Paris, where it would hang for two years, only a few miles away from the Louvre. At one point, Perugia was close to being discovered. When police arrived at his door, to search and question him. But fortunately for Perugia, they fell for his alibi. During these two years, 
Thousands flocked to see the empty space where the Mona Lisa used to hang. With the Mona Lisa having gone missing, Balfierno's master plan came into action. He travelled to Los Angeles with Chaudron in order to deliver the paintings to his clients. With no one knowing where the original was, each client believed theirs was the real thing and paid $300,000 for each fake. In 1913, Perugia returned to Italy, bringing the stolen painting with him. After waiting two years for Valfiorno to contact and pay him, he decided to take matters into his own hands. He contacted an art dealer, Alfredo Geri, and tried to broker a deal on the piece of stolen art, asking for 500,000 lire. Perugia believed he was doing Italy a favour by returning the painting to his homeland. Jerry became suspicious and contacted a friend of his who analysed if the painting was authentic or a fake. Upon realisation that it was in fact the real Mona Lisa, they contacted the police. Perugia was later arrested and for months the Mona Lisa was in exhibitions all around Italy. Eventually it was returned to France and back in the Louvre. Although the Mona Lisa was already seen as a famous painting, the media coverage of the events turned it into an international sensation. Perugia was tried in Italy and stated that he stole the painting as an act of patriotism, believing it should stay in Italy where it rightfully belongs. However, Leonardo da Vinci's assistant inherited it after da Vinci's death in 1519 and then sold it to the King of France, Francis I, meaning it was now French property, not Italian. Perugia quickly gained popularity in his home country and was seen as a national icon. He was sentenced to over a year in prison, but ended up only serving seven months. During his imprisonment, he received many gifts from fellow Italians who praised his attempts of recovering the painting. These included fine wines, cakes and love letters. Not long after being set free, the First World War broke out and he served in the Italian army. Afterwards, he returned to Paris to continue working as a carpenter. He died in 1925 in a small town outside of Paris on his 44th birthday. With him died the secret plan of Alfierno and Chaudron. Not once did he mention his accomplices. It wasn't until 1932 with the death of Alfierno that the huge story behind the theft of the Mona Lisa came to light. In the Saturday Evening Post, a journalist by the name of Carl Decker wrote an article which revealed the truth behind the robbery. In the article, Decker states that he had spoken to Valfierno personally in 1913, revealing the details behind the theft. Decker, a man of his word, promised not to publish the story until after Valfierno's death. Valfierno stated in various accounts that Chaudron went on to live peacefully in the countryside, continuing to produce forgeries. However, none of his forgeries have ever been located in over a hundred years. It seems that nobody knew who this man was, which makes us question his existence. It's possible that the whole backstory to the robbery was simply a creation made by Decker in order to get media attention. Although it's more probable that Perugia acted alone, it's interesting to think that there's a small possibility that behind the theft of the Mona Lisa was one of the biggest art scams in history. Thanks for everyone for watching. Uh, I hope you enjoyed uh, Forgotten Lives. Subscribe and stay tuned for more videos in the future. I'm going to upload hopefully once a week and maybe even twice a week if you guys are lucky. So. Social love and support and I'll see you guys in the next video. Thank you.